All right, Genesis, uh, the foundation book of the Bible. This is lesson number seven and simply entitled day number two and number three. All right, so far we've talked about the events of the first day of creation. And I want to kind of back up a little bit here about something that I mentioned last time about the creation of angels. There's always a little discussion about that. There's always been a debate whether God created angels you know, before He began to create the universe or if He did it on the first day. I know it doesn't change a lot in our lives, you know, but people who like to debate these uh, topics uh, often debate that, uh, uh, that idea. There's no way of knowing this. You know, it, it, it's great to debate. So there's no way of actually knowing it, but here's what we do know, at least some of the things that we do know about angels and creation, so on and so forth. First of all, uh, they are created beings. They're spiritual in nature. This we know, Matthew 22 talks about that, verse 30. We also know that they were present when the earth was being formed. Reading Job, Job chapter 38, verses 47, tells us that they were there. They, they rejoiced when God created. Now, whether they were created on the same day, we don't know this you know, for sure, but we know that they, were, that they were present. And we also know that Satan, one of the angels, was cast down with other rebellious angels when they disobeyed God. Again, we don't have information about what exactly this disobedience was. Uh, one of the thoughts was, well, since they were originally created to minister to man, perhaps it was a refusal to minister to man that sent them down and, you know, and they, they lost their position. In other words, man was created a little lower than the angels and maybe you know, because of pride, there was a refusal to, to do that. That's, one, that's been one uh, theory. Another one is that uh, they were uh, cast down, or the, the sin was that they left their original positions. And you read about that in Jude, verse six. And we're going to talk about this leaving their original positions. We're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get to Genesis chapter six. So we'll kind of revisit this angels and what they did wrong uh, business, perhaps uh, Genesis chapter six will shed some light on that. Last time also said that they may have been created during the first day, but as others have mentioned, there's equal evidence that they may have been created before this as well. Either way, they were present when God created the universe on the first day. All right, so some of the other things that we've talked about so far. On that first day, God brings into existence the time, space, matter, elements, they have no form, they have no energy, they have no light, just the basic elements are created. Then we read that these basic elements are energized by the power of the Holy Spirit and because of that they take on form and energy. So a lot of times you know, our thought is in creation, God said let there be, boom, you know, and everything was there, but, but if you read carefully in, 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 in the verses, he creates the elements first and then he forms them into something, okay? Uh, then he creates the basis for light, which is the electromagnetic system, or spectrum rather. And then he sets into motion the dark light cycle, which has remained night and day cycle, which we experience to this day. So we've already talked about this, just kind of reviewing the, you know, the high points as we move along. Now, we've also discussed the idea that in the Bible or in, in, in Genesis, the word day is the Hebrew word yom. And the Hebrew word yom refers to a 24 hour period. And some of the theories that try to merge you know, uh, the creation teaching in the Bible with the teachings on evolution, you know, they try to merge these together and one of the ways that they do that is by claiming that the Hebrew word yom, which refers to a single day, actually refers to an eon or an age. And that way they say, so each day could be millions and millions of years, thereby merging together evolution and creation. But we've said that the, you know, we need to let the Bible say what it says. You know? Yom is the word for day, one 24-hour day. It's never used in the context of a, 
an eon or an age. It's never used in that way. And I think that God, you know, I think He knows which words to, to use. Uh, he knows how to inspire uh, those who wrote the Bible. Um, let's see, that's four. Um, oh yeah, so this first day of creation, a night-day cycle approximately six to 10,000 years ago is what Genesis describes as the beginning of our world. And of course, this has been attacked and ridiculed by evolutionists and other scientists, but as their theories change to accommodate new findings, you see, the scientists that, that kind of uh, war against the, uh, the idea of creation and they, they put forward their concept of you know, how the world came to be, the problem is that their theory continues to change. You know, at one time it was, well, matter is, was always there. And then, well, no, there was a big bang. And then, well, there, really there was no big bang. And now it's, well, there were many big bangs. So the theory behind how the world came to be without reference to God, those theories continue to change all the time. But the teaching in the Bible remains exactly the same. You know, in 1852, whoever was standing in front of a class teaching the, the Bible and the story of creation was teaching exactly the same thing that I'm teaching today. And in 1303 and in 914 and in, in the second century, always the same thing and even before Christ, always the same thing was being taught as to how the world was created. Men, women went to the word, they had access to it, they opened up to Genesis, they read it, and the same theory, not theory, but the same uh, teaching would come out, the same one as we're, doing to, uh, as we're doing today. So despite all of the criticism over the years, our model, the creation model, remains constant and it withstands all of the investigation and criticism throughout the ages. You got to remember one thing. We think our science is the most modern, up-to-date, you know, but you know in, in the 1800s they thought their science was the most modern, up-to-date thing and, you, and 500 years before that they thought that their science and their thinking was the most modern. You know, every generation thinks that, oh, we've got it now. And the beauty of the scripture is the scripture never changed, it's always the same. Men change, theories change. All right, so that's kind of what we talked about in the last couple of weeks. We're going to start with uh, day two. Genesis chapter one, verses uh, six, seven, and eight says, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day, a second yam, another 24 hours. Now, in simple terms, we usually say that God created the sky on the second day. You know, if you go to the kids class, God created the sky on the second day. This is true, but what is happening here is a feature of the pre-sin world, which no longer is part of our world today. In verse six, the term firmament or expanse means actual, some Bibles say firmament, some Bibles say expanse, depends which version you have. It means a spread out thinness. That's what the word means. Something spread out and very thin, like thin crust pizza, you know what I'm saying? Thin, all right? In the Bible, the word heaven, when it's translated into English, the word heaven is used to describe three different places depending on context. So much in the Bible depends on context because one word is used in a lot of different ways, so you have to look at the context to understand which way it's being used. So for this word, this word heaven or firmament, it can mean the atmosphere, the clouds. When we're talking about heaven in the Bible, it can mean the atmosphere or the clouds up in the sky, Jeremiah 4.25, for example. Or the same word can be used to describe the stars, 
the planets, okay, space. So when we're saying I'm looking up into the sky, you know, up into heaven, we, we might mean the heaven, you know, the atmosphere, the, the clouds, or we might mean space. And when we talk in English, we differentiate that, don't we? When we're talking about outer space, we're not talking about what we can see. And then the word heaven or firmament can also mean the place where God dwells. You know, God is in heaven. You know, mommy's gone to heaven. Mama died and she's gone to heaven, the place where God is, Hebrews 9, 24. So the term firmament is used in the same way, whether it be atmosphere or space, depending on the context. Always the same word, context. In this passage, this term refers to the atmosphere. The atmosphere. What did God create? Not the outer space, not talking about the heaven where God is, talking about the atmosphere. All right. So what happens now is that God creates the unique atmosphere that permits life on earth and separates two bands of water. The water above and the water below the atmosphere. So the waters under the firmament, the expanse, would be the water on or under the earth. That's the water below. And the waters above the firmament would be a special water vapor canopy that would provide the unique environment that existed in the pre-flood world. Remember, before the flood is what we're talking about here. Uh, in the world of Adam and Eve. And I think there's a, a diagram. So let's look at the diagram. Whoops. The letters are a little small there that you can see, but I think, uh, we'll, I think you have uh, something on your sheets there. First of all, there's the atmosphere or the clouds, okay? Uh, excuse me. Uh, the, uh, there's the liquid water on the earth, that first uh, arrow there that's pointing to the, that orange ball that you see in the uh, diagram. There's the liquid water that's on the earth. Then there's the atmosphere, the gaseous atmosphere that is around the earth. And then there's the water above the atmosphere, the vapor canopy. Okay? So the thing that many of us forget is that the world we live in now is very different from the world that God created. It's not only different from a moral perspective, but it's also different from an ecological and environmental perspective as well. Not the same world that we live in. Okay. So in this passage, God has not yet formed the water on the earth into anything. He has established the earth's atmosphere and the vapor canopy which, according to Dr. Henry Morris, uh, you know, we've talked about his book, The uh, Genesis Flood, according to him, a water vapor, a, a water vapor canopy, if you wish, which would give this earth and its first inhabitants a special environment which would have special features. So you've got the water on the earth, you've got the atmosphere, you know, the sky, and then you have this vapor canopy around all of it. And so what would this vapor canopy that surrounds the atmosphere and the earth, what would this water, uh, this, I keep saying water, what would this vapor canopy do for the earth? Well, first of all, it would maintain a uniform and warm temperature, like a greenhouse. You know, you, you want to grow, you, ever, you go to the Crystal Bridge in January, you know, it's 24 degrees outside, you go inside the, inside the crystal bridge you know, and you're seeing you know, exotic plants growing and so on and so forth. Why? Because 12 months of the year, they artificially maintain a certain temperature, a certain humidity level within the, uh, what do they call it? The, um, the greenhouse. Well, the vapor canopy around the earth, around the atmosphere of the earth, served to do exactly that thing for the earth. It maintained a certain uniform temperature and humidity. 
Secondly, the water canopy, um, because it created a uniform temperature, there would be no wind storms, no tornadoes in uh, the time of Adam and Eve, no tornadoes, why? Extreme wind, always caused by the same thing, right? Cold air moving in, warm air moving up. When these two collide, you get these terrible wind storms. Well, in a, in a world where the temperature, where the climate is controlled, there are no wind storms. There is no wild wind because there are no air currents. Everything is maintained. Also, another interesting feature of that pre-sin world is uh, no rain except over bodies of water where evaporation would occur directly. Now we say, man, we need rain. You know, we need, what, 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 how, what do you do with no rain? Well, there's another thing that the water canopy does. The water canopy uh, provides a proper temperature which permits proper humidity and moisture which would create lush uh, vegetation and and no desert. Desert is when there is no rain, uh, you know, overgrowing grass and ferns where it's too much rain. Go to Portland, go to, or, you know, go to the Northwest, and you know, it's nice, it's lush. Well, it's lush because in the cities they maintain it. But go somewhere where nobody maintains it and you'll see it's, it's, not, it's overgrown. The uh, best example, when I lived in, uh, in San Diego, well, San Diego, you know, Southern California, that's a desert. It's a desert climate. And as, as we were driving around, but it's beautiful. Everywhere you go, palm trees, manicured lawns, beautiful flowers, you know, I mean, stuff that here we try to grow in our garden and, and have you know, a lot of care for. This stuff is growing in the medians, you know, between the highway, you know, in the street. And a person who had lived there all their life said to me, oh yeah, but take a look, he said, there isn't a single lawn, there isn't a single median in the city, not a single tree that does not have a sprinkler system. It's completely controlled with you know, uh, 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 sprinkler systems everywhere. I mean, they, they pave the road, they create a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a road separator in the middle like we do here. They plant trees and boy, they're putting in the sprinkler system because those trees will not survive. And you know how you see that? You're in California, you're in Southern California and you go to the border to Mexico. And on this side of the border, you've got San Diego and it's lush and green and flowers. And you just cross the border into Tijuana and then you drive and you took, it's the very same land. No more lush, no more, it's, it, it is what it is, a very dry desert-like place, okay? So water, you know, not enough gives you the desert, too much gives you something that's overgrown, but in the original design of the world, there was uniform and proper moisture from the underground streams, from the water vapor canopy that was maintaining the temperature. Another feature, the canopy would also act as a filter for ultraviolet and cosmic and other destructive energies from space, which are the source cause of many cancers and other mutations that cause death. So a lot of the, you know, I mean, we, we see it now, right? What's, what you, your kids go outside to play in the summertime and what do you do for them if you're wise? Yeah, you lather them up with SP50 or whatever it is, why? Well, you don't want the sun rays to be on them, not only get a sunburn, but dangerous for cancer and so on and so forth. The water canopy provides a filter to filter out these dangerous things. And then finally, uh, modern biomedical research has shown that higher barometric pressure created by such a water vapor and all the other advantages would promote better health and decrease the susceptibility to disease and all the problems that come with it. So this same water canopy that provided the earth with such, as, such advantages was later used by God, not to the advantage of the earth, but to the disadvantage of the earth. In other words, God would 
further on down the line would use that vapor canopy surrounding the atmosphere in a way to create the flood. In Genesis chapter seven, verse 11, we read, I just skip ahead there, it says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open. Those were the underground water system that were there when God created the earth. But watch what he says. And the floodgates of the sky were open. The floodgates of the sky, we think, are the clouds. But you know, Moses is not referring to the clouds here. He's referring to the vapor canopy. This is what God used. The floodgates of the deep, those are the underground rivers. The floodgates of the sky was the water canopy. Now an interesting, again, I'm no scientist obviously, but an interesting note from scientists about this phenomenon. Scientists tell us that if all the water from the present atmosphere were to descend on the earth, you know, all, at one, all the clouds that surround the earth at this time, if all of them released all the water that was in them all together at the same time, it would cover the entire earth with one inch of water. Just one inch of water. Now we have floods because what happens is that it's concentrated in one place for too long. But if it was all the water you know, spread evenly over the earth, only create one inch of water. Surely not enough to create the great flood. However, if the water vapor that was originally created, if that is dissolved, now we have enough water and an explanation as to the change in the weather and ecological pattern that the world experiences today. And so in Genesis, um, in Genesis um, Moses explains that originally the earth has water underneath it and around it. And when God decides to bring the flood on the earth, the water that's underneath breaks open and the water that's around the canopy uh, or that forms the canopy is dissolved. And an interesting thing, you know, there's a movie coming out, uh, Noah, uh, but not a, not a low budget, there are a lot of religious movies that come out, usually low budget affairs. I know the, the people who do them have, they're well-meaning and so on and so forth. But this is not a low budget film. This is a big budget Hollywood, you know, uh, what's his name, Crow is in it, and other you know, A-line actors. And what they've managed to do is, you know, using the fantastic uh, ability to do all the, you know, the CGI stuff, you know, all the uh, uh, computer generated effects, you know, uh, applied to the story of Noah, I mean, if they get it right, it's pretty spectacular. And I saw a preview of the movie. And in the movie, in this preview, it's when the water begins to fall. And they got one, I hadn't seen the movie yet, it isn't out. But they surely got one part right because as the, you know, Noah says, it's time, you know, like in the movie, you know, uh, Russell Crowe, I think he says, it's time, you know. And all of a sudden you see the earth explode and you see water shooting out from underneath the earth like fountains, you know, just popping up. And I'm saying, way to go, guys. You got it. You understood what this is. You know, maybe these guys in Hollywood, not interested in promoting the gospel, I think they may just be interested in making money, but at least they're accurate on that score. It'd be interesting to see how else they, uh, they describe it. So because of the flood, the original design of the earth when it comes to water and temperature was dramatically changed. And so today we see very different temperatures instead of a uniform temperature everywhere. Now you've got cold, extreme cold, extreme hot. You've got wild climates um, caused by massive air currents. Now, you know, I love the weathermen, they're always inventing new terms. You know. Now we have this thing called the Arctic vortex, you know, which is just another word for a big wind coming from the north, you know, from Canada. 
You know? But I love the weather maps. What are they showing? These air patterns, these tremendously cold air patterns coming down uh, from the north. And in the spring we know the warm air parent, uh, currents coming from the south. Pretty soon we're going to be hearing about tornadoes. We've heard about earthquakes, rain and its problems, right? I mean, you got to have just enough rain, too much and it floods the farmer's fields. Not enough, the crops die. Deserts, droughts, the development of disease and mutations and death through illness not directly caused by man. Leukemia, you know, what, what is cancer other than simply mutations, right? Just mutations. And of course, a shortened lifespan to 75 years rather than the 700 to 1,000 years directly before the flood. It's very interesting if you want to do a study. Look at how long all these people lived. You know, 700, 800, 900 years. You know, telling the story right up to Noah and then boom, right after the flood, all of a sudden now they're living 500 years, 400 years. There's like a drop immediately from one chapter to another. So we see that even the lifespan and life expectancy has been changed by the dramatic weather changes uh, due to the flood. So this is the end of day number two with the creation of the atmosphere and the separation of the water mass on earth and the water canopy or the vapor canopy above the atmosphere. So you have the canopy up here, you have the uh, atmosphere here, you have the earth here and you have the water contained. All right, now I begin day number three because it kind of finishes off something here. Let's read that. It says, then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And so we see here you know, a certain order in how God divides the elements to form creation. Always the same pattern. First He forms the elements, He creates the elements rather, then He forms them in some way. So we see on day one, light from darkness separated. Day two, waters above from waters below separated. Day three, dry land from, well, not wetland, but from water, separated, okay? So by the language in the verses, we believe that the composition of the land and the seas was not at this time the same as it is today. The flood changed not only the atmosphere and the weather, but it also changed the arrangement of the land and oceans. And we have a lot of people studying that saying, well, there was a time when you know, there was a, a land bridge and you know, the continents are not exactly you know, placed in the same way as they were a long time ago. They don't attribute this to the flood, but the Bible does. So the fact that God says that it is good states that this original arrangement of canopy, atmosphere, seas, and land as it was arranged then was the ideal manner to promote human life and not necessarily as it is uh, organized now. And I make a little thing here. You know how people say, you know, why do you know, little babies die and so on and so forth? It's so not fair and we say, well, sin caused that. And somebody says, what do you mean sin caused? How can sin cause this little baby to be born with a you know, genetic defect or something like that? Well, indirectly sin. You know, sin was what caused the flood, and flood is what destroyed the ecosystem as it was, and the environment as it was, and because of that, we live in a fallen, not only a fallen human state, but we also live in a fallen ecological state, and because of that, there are things that happen that no one has control over. So in that way, you know, you know, you die from sins you do. You, know, you, you drink a bottle of gin every day for 30 years and pretty much your liver is pickled. You know? uh, why did you die? Well, because you, 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 you sinned. You, know, you abused alcohol, so there's a direct correlation there. But sometimes there is no direct correlation. You know, why did the little baby die or the little boy die or something like that? Well, sometimes it's the indirect result of sin because we live in a, we live in a fallen 
in a fallen society. All right, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to continue the third part of the day next week. A couple of lessons, though, that we can draw. Some people say, there are lessons here? Sure there are. Lesson number one, God knows what is best for us. Let's face it, He carefully designed the world so we would not suffer from you know, sinus headaches or cancer. He didn't design that world. That world exists because of Adam's sin and the fall of man and the flood that destroyed the ecosystem and the, and the downward spiral that we have been on since then. So in this fallen world, you know, we should continually trust and obey God to know what is best for us. Lesson number two, it's okay to pray about the weather. If you ever wondered, if you ever felt silly about praying about the weather, it's okay to pray about the weather. It's not okay to think you can control the weather by rituals, you know, by throwing salt up in the air or putting a chicken on your head and running around. You know, that's not okay. No. But it's okay. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Colby. Uh, but it's okay to pray about the weather. Why? Because God gave careful consideration to the matter of wind and rain and heat and cold and He has used weather to test His people, to punish His people, and to bless His people. Has He not? Of course He. You know, take a look at what happened in Egypt. The, the curses that came on the Pharaoh and the Egyptians, many of them were weather related. So God has not changed. He continues to have power over these. It's okay to praise Him for a beautiful morning and appeal to Him to control bad and damaging weather. He didn't create damaging weather. It's the result of the fallen world. But we can appeal to Him to help us you know, manage the earth and to help us when damaging weather is overwhelming us with you know, crop failure or whatever it is. You know, maybe we're not Maybe we're not praying enough about the weather. You know, maybe there's too much rain coming down because there's not enough prayers going up. You ever think about that? So I, I you know, of course I used to pray about the weather a whole lot more when I lived in Canada, but. <laughs> and then the final one, we'll close with this. Why doubt such an awesome God? I mean, look at what He does without effort. Why do we ever doubt His care or His ability or His willingness to help us and to save us and to provide for us? Remember, the same God who said, let there be light, and the light existed, this is the same God that we're saying, Lord, help me with my sore back or help my little boy who's sick or help our marriage to be better. It's the same God that's, that you're praying to. Why doubt such an awesome God? Okay, we continue with the days next time. We meet. Thank you for your attention.